says be ready in season and out right be ready in season and out so I was uh, at the grocery store when uh, when I found out that I'd be on the pulpit this morning so this is not my first time to fill the pulpit I, I don't uh, talk about this a lot uh, but uh, I actually served for three and a half years uh, in pulpit ministry at a church in Omaha Nebraska uh, so this is uh, not the first time I've given this message either so when I got the call I didn't have time to you know go start rooting something together so I will uh, uh, repeat for you a, a message that I had given once before the past. Randy, if we could get the first slide up. This just in from Alaska. <laughs> yeah, the children are out. Right? <laughs> okay, next slide. So uh, this mom goes into the uh, post office to buy some stamps. Uh, she's going she's gonna to send her Christmas cards, right? So she says to the clerk, can I, can I get 50 Christmas stamps, please? The clerk says, yes, ma'am, well, what denomination would you like? And she says, oh, good Lord. Has it come to this? All right, give me six Catholic, uh, 12 Presbyterian, and 22 Baptists. Right? So, so, some of you are probably going through the experience right now as we get ready for Christmas. And I love how J.J. emphasizes the message that this is about remembering that God did something scandalous. Something Scandalous. It should take your breath away. What did he do that was so scandalous? He came down from the glory of heaven and took on the flesh of a stinking race of lost people in order that he might take upon himself the sins of the entire world and go to Calvary to be nailed to a tree, humiliated, and worse than that, God the Father poured out his hot wrath on the Son so that Jesus Christ would pay it all. And Jesus, very obediently to his Father, every minute that he was on this earth, drank that cup down <coughs> to the last drop, if you please, and took upon himself the sins of the entire human race. No Christmas, no Calvary. No Christmas, no emancipation for you and me. No Christmas, no everlasting life for all who believe. So hallelujah and thank the Lord above. We are not commanded in Scripture to celebrate and worship the birth of Jesus Christ, but I happen to believe he is worth it. All right, so this morning, if we have the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, something the pastor has brought up for us, this uh, story of the wise men. And I want to reflect on these guys who came to worship the king of the Jews. So we'll spend a little bit of time remembering uh, the story of the song that we, we sing so often at Christmas time, We Three Kings of Orient. Of course, you know, in the scripture, there, uh, it doesn't say how many of them there were. So we don't know if there were three. There might have been there were more. It's plural, so we know there were at least two. But we don't know. It could have been, could have been a dozen guys. We, we just don't know. And uh, from the Orient, yes, they were from east of the land of Israel, but oftentimes, I mean, Christmas cards and so on, you see them drawn, and, and, and some of them will look like they're, they're East Asian. Let me be clear, they were not. <laughs> and we'll dig into that a little bit and, and try to understand some things. So Matthew's Gospel records a little bit about the event to which that, that hymn refers. And uh, here's a picture, next slide please, of the uh, traditional nativity scene. Of course, we've got a crash set up right up here in the front. Most of them have shepherds and wise men uh, together uh, gathered around the baby Jesus, and our pastor has rightly taught us, as he is inclined to do, this is a terrible anachronism. Uh, this never happened. Uh, and interestingly, none of the gospel accounts speaks of both groups of visitors. Luke says nothing about the Magi whatsoever. Matthew says nothing about the shepherds. So we can be very confident that they were not together at any point in time. 
Next slide, please. So Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, gives us the record of some shepherds in the field. Now, um, a word about shepherds. It, in the first century, uh, they were modernized into the Roman world. They were modernized into the Roman world. And so men who were working as shepherds, men in Israel who worked in the fields taking care of animals for agriculture, these were guys who did not get good grades in school. All right? These were guys that did not advance through the system of Jewish learning because the way it was all set up was this. When you were a kid, they, they start you off in Hebrew school. And if you're really good at it, uh, you advance very quickly, learning your alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Daleth, Hey, Wat, Zion. This is the Hebrew alphabet. You learn that right off the bat. Then you start digging into the Torah. And the kids who had an aptitude for learning the Torah got to move on to a middle school. And there was another selective cut. And the ones who did very, very well got to go on to advanced learning in the Hebrew scriptures. The other kids were sent away to go learn how to do other things. So the kids who didn't go to the grades had to learn to work with their hands. We see Jesus, whose earthly father, well, he was a carpenter. That tells you he didn't score so well in Hebrew school, okay? But at least he wasn't a shepherd, okay? Shepherds were the guys who couldn't get jobs doing anything else. So that's why they were out taking care of a bunch of live animals for agriculture, because they weren't the most intelligent, gifted men according to human standards. But the fact is, God sent an angel to those guys. And why did he do that? In part, it is, I think, a commentary on how God takes a look at the human race and evaluates our way of differentiating the one who is successful from the one who isn't. And let me tell you, in God's economy, in the way that God looks at the human race, it is not your advanced education. It is not your adjusted gross income on your 1040 form. This is not what impresses the Most High God. What impresses the Most High God is a man or a woman who puts their faith in the Word of God. Amen. These shepherds, these worker bees, these blue-collar men, all right, evidently had deep faith in the Torah, deep faith in the prophets, and they knew that the God of Israel was faithful and that someday he would send a promised Messiah. We don't know. It doesn't say but they may have had a prayer meeting before they went out to work that night in the fields, right? right? And maybe, wouldn't it be something if we find out later when we get to heaven, that they prayed, oh, Father, send a redeemer. This Roman yoke is difficult and hard to bear. Would you send someone to rescue us? Send our Messiah. And so that night, God, who in the past restricted the ability of men to see angels, put another way, he restricted angels' ability to present themselves before men. <clears throat> Earlier in the Old Testament, there were many examples where men saw angels of all kinds, fallen angels, elect angels, they saw angels. That was pulled back. God did not want men to have so much interaction with these angelic beings whom he created. So whenever there was an appearance of an angel, whenever an angel came to see someone and they could know that they were there, it was because God specifically authorized it. So for example, when the angel appeared to Mary to let her know you're going to give birth to the Son of God, that was a specific authorization that God allowed the angel to appear before a person. Okay. So in the same fashion, these angels, this angel who came to visit the shepherds, was there on God's authority. He was there because God the Father had authorized him to release some good news from heaven. Some good news that the angel came to tell about the Messiah's birth. Slide, please. And suddenly, a multitude of the heavenly host, the angelic armies of heaven, and I believe these were warrior angels standing in formation at dress right dress in their immaculate dress uniforms. And they had already assembled and were already present when the first angel had come. And they were standing in formation. Maybe they were doing their dress right dress thing and getting all in position. When God the Father said, okay, now, hit it, boys, and the lights came on, and there they were, right? And suddenly there were, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host. Whenever you see that word host, that has to do with the angelic armies of heaven. There are millions of them. And you know who their commanding officer is? Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God. We call him Yahweh Sabaoth for a reason. 
Yahweh Sabaoth is the Hebrew way of saying commander of heaven's armies. That's Jesus Christ. So their commander, the Most High God, had just taken on the form of Adam and was lying in a stinking manger in a stable. Imagine how they felt. There's a beautiful song, several years old now, by um, Alan Jackson. It's a duet with uh, Alison Krauss. Beautiful song. And it's called, And the Angels Cry. They cried because the Son of God was now in this condition. And they knew why the Father had sent the Son. He was going to suffer. He was going to die. He was their commanding general. And it hurt. And they trusted the Father. The Father's plan is perfect. I don't understand it. I can't see the end of this. But I trust your plan, Yahweh Sabaoth. I will stick with you. And so when the Father authorized them to come stand in formation near where Jesus lay, they said, yes, sir. Thank you. We get to go be near our king. And let me tell you, they were there around that manger scene in a defensive corridor protecting that little baby. Mary and Joseph couldn't see them, perhaps, but they were there. And so they were delighted to appear and sing in choir formation. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the local military bands when they get together in the book. We live in D.C. What a marvelous privilege that is when you see these magnificent warriors in their dress uniforms and those beautiful voices, the, the, the musicians and the, and the choirs. Listen, that is a minuscule little whiff from the kitchen of what it's going to be like for us when we hear those angelic choirs in their dress uniforms like these, these uh, shepherds did that night. It will blow us away. All right, God had come to man, and so God the Father authorized a special appearance of the angelic choir to announce that great truth. Slide, please. So then we have the account of shepherds being told to find the baby lying in the manger. And by the way, the manger that we have outside that is in a sorry state of repair after a windstorm, I don't know if you saw that, but we've constructed one out of wood, right? And that's how Europeans built mangers. So listen, we're descended from Europeans. We, we are accustomed to European way of thinking and history. So we've got a European style wooden manger. Let me clarify, that is not how mangers and uh, those sorts of scenes, stables in the uh, time of Israel, uh, in the time in which Christ was born, they were holes in a rock uh, face. So a uh, bit of like a cave, okay? Interestingly enough, uh, Jesus Christ, after he was born, was laid in a manger inside a place that looked very much like a burial cave. This one was used for animals, but it looked like a burial cave. And the scripture says that he was wrapped in swaddling cloth. Most likely, strips of linen used for wrapping corpses of those who had died. The Son of God had come to earth and taken on human flesh. He was born to die for the human race. So he was laid inside what looked like a crypt and wrapped in burial cloth as a visible picture of what Messiah had come to do. The visit from the wise men came much later. In between, Jesus, or Yeshua, as his parents called him, was taken to Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, the capital, on the eighth day to where the temple was, and he was circumcised according to the Torah, Exodus chapter 13, Leviticus 12. Slide, please. Sacrifice was then offered his mother, uh, Mary. Uh, next slide. Uh, after 33 days, she went up to the temple, and because she was a good Jewish girl, she offered a sacrifice of two double doves. A sin offering, a purification offering, according to the provision of the law of Moses for a young lady who didn't have the money to pay for a lamb, which was the right offering. She couldn't afford one, so that's why she gave the offering of two turtle doves. Slide. Dr. Luke then records how an elderly believer named Simeon, who faithfully had waited for Messiah's birth, who was rewarded by, because of his faithfulness, because he trusted in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he was enabled by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, to recognize that infant baby as Moshiach, Messiah of Israel. And he was happy to see him. He delighted in seeing him. Sorry. As did Anna. The Luke, uh, Luke adds to his account that there was an elderly 
a prophetess, that is, someone who talked about the truth of Scripture. Her name was Hannah, which we know as Anna. She was of the tribe of Asher, and she was also identified as one who would recognize that baby as Israel's promised Messiah. These were people, men and women, who had already trusted in the future coming Messiah of Israel. They had trusted, been convicted by the Torah, by the Nevi, the prophets, the Ketuvim, the writings. They knew that God was going to send a Messiah. They had already placed their confidence in that Messiah before he even came. So it was the most natural thing for them when they saw him in the flesh to say, Aha, he is here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Baruch Hashem, the Lord has come. Praise Slide. Amen. Scholars estimate at least two years had elapsed from the time he was born until the wise men finally arrived, during which time Mary and Joseph had set up housekeeping. Not in a stable anymore. The shepherds never saw the wise men by a, a manger. So let's do take an account from the Gospel of Matthew. This is a passage that's very familiar. We've actually read it recently. I'm going to read from... Uh, next slide, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, if you are able physically, I'm going to ask for this reading of God's word. Would you, in honor of the scripture, please stand with me as I read from Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, I'm going to be reading in the New King James. You can follow along in any translation that you like, as long as it's faithful to the original scripture. I'm in chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Bayit Lacham in Hebrew, by the way, that means the house of the bread makers. The house of the bread makers. That's where they baked the bread for the temple. That's a pretty good place for the bread that came down from heaven to be born. So Jesus was born in Bayit Lacham of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born, the Mashiach, the Messiah. So they said to him, Bethlehem, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet Micah and the prophet Jacob. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you found him, bring him back, that I may come and worship him also. And he was lying. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Oh my, this is good news. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, Miriam, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Thank you. Please be seated. So what we have here is the record of the visit of wise men from the east who had been led by a star. Thank you for advancing the slide. Anatole is the Greek word that translates into east, as we have it here in the scripture. There in Matthew 21, chapter, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 2, verse 1. And so that word east, as I said before, does not mean Japan. It doesn't mean China. It doesn't mean Mongolia or Thailand. It always, in Scripture, when you see the east, it's referring to the land that's east of Israel. Israel is on the east coast of the Mediterranean. To the east of Israel is Jordan today. Beyond Jordan, modern-day Iraq. Okay? That's what they're talking about. Babylon, Shinar, the land between two rivers, that's where these people came from. They were Babylonians from the east, Anatole, Mesopotamia, Iraq. That's what it means, okay? And then, next slide, magos was a term that meant uh, an honorific term for those. We might have actually skipped one. Uh, if we could go back one more. Back one, maybe? One more. There we go. Wise men from the east. That's a name that's magos. That's the, 
The parent word in Greek, magos, is the word from which we get the English word magic, magician. It comes from this word. And that's why we call them magi, right? It is a transliteration of that Greek word. What that means is these were men from the advanced school of learning about astrology. Soothsayers, fortune tellers, if you will. They had studied the dark arts and grown up in the Babylonian Academy of Astronomy. So let's forward a couple more slides or any to the blank slide for me. So these people had an interest in coming to see the Jewish Messiah. They wanted to find out what's going on. Matthew's account contains a record of astrologer magicians from Babylon, modern day Iraq, who had followed a star to come to Israel. And many, including some Christians, have since from that deduced, well, you see, the Bible says it's okay to practice astrology. Let me be crystal clear. That could be nothing further from the truth. The unchanging God feels the same way today about astrology as he did when he wrote in the Torah and commanded Israel, have nothing to do with an astrologer or a soothsayer or a necromancer. Don't try to access secret information from the dead or from the stars or from anything else. If there's something I want you to know, I'll give it to you in the scripture. Amen. Okay? Amen. God hasn't changed his mind about that. Amen. All right then. So what's with the astrologers? Well, they weren't there because of astrology. Oh, they were following a star. Yes, but not because of astrology. They were following a star for a different reason. Why were they following a star? Well, for that, you'd have to look back in the book of Daniel. So I'm going to read a little passage from Daniel. If you'd like to read along with me, I'll be in the first chapter of the book of Daniel, which is in the Old Testament. You'll find it after the Psalms. It comes before the New Testament. It's between Ezekiel and Hosea. Now, Daniel was written during the time of Israel's captivity in Babylon, 400 years before. Israel had been taken to Babylon, where they were instructed in the language of the Babylonians, which was Aramaic. Slide, please. So Daniel, he was a young man when he was taken out of Israel in captivity and dragged off, marched all the way across Jordan into modern-day Iraq. A long way, walking through the desert, in chains no less. He finally arrives in Babylon. Several passages record then that he was uh, placed into the Babylonian court. Uh, he was among a bunch of magicians, men who were trained in magic, fortune telling, and astronomy. So I'll read from Daniel chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. If I can get the next slide, please. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in, captive young men from Israel, before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel. Daniel, his name, Daniel, it means God is my judge. And with him was Hananiah. Hananiah, Hananiah means Yahweh has favored. Also was Mishael, whose name means who or what is like our God. What a beautiful name. And then there was Azariah, Azariah, or Azariah, which means Yahweh has helped me. Therefore, they served before the king. These were four boys, four young men, who had put their faith in the God of Israel. These were four young men whose life was turned upside down. Their country was ransacked and invaded by a foreign army. They were dragged away into captivity. Their circumstances sucked. They did not have access to their Xbox anymore. All right? <laughs> They were in a tough spot, but they decided not to give in to circumstances. They decided not to let circumstances dictate how they would behave and whom they would believe. Praise the Lord. These young men were sold out, if I can put it that way, for Jesus Christ. They had put their faith in the God of Israel, the future Messiah. They didn't know his name was Jesus, but they loved him. And so Daniel was privileged as a servant of the Most High to reveal information about the God of Israel, information about events that stretched across generations, thousands of years yet future when the time when he told, far beyond the ability of any of those two-bit court magicians who were there in Babylon. In fact, Daniel's prophecies were so accurate, so on the nose, that liberal scholars today would advance theologic degrees doubt whether Daniel could have actually written these things before they took place. Let me be clear. He did. 
How did he do that? By the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is all about revealing things through his servants, the prophets. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Behold, I do nothing unless I first reveal it through my servants, the prophets. Amen. Daniel had a special empowerment by the Holy Spirit to give some information that Israel needed to know. Because things had gone haywire in God's plan for his nation, Israel. These people were his choice nation. And where were they? They were in Babylon, not in the land, Ha'eretz, the land of Israel that he had promised to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for eternity. Why are they in Babylon? Because of foul disobedience to the word of God. Because of foul disobedience to the word of God, he puked them out of the land into captivity. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think that the Most High God is going to look at what's going on in our country today and spare us this Gentile nation when he treated Israel like this? So in the midst of that compressed adversity, he gave revelation through Daniel who taught that one day the God of Israel would come in person as Messiah, the liberator king. And he said, simply by trusting in that God who will become flesh, they could receive eternal life as a free gift to all who believe. Now, a set of circumstances came to pass. We read about that in Daniel chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, where King Nebi was having some foul dreams that were messing him up, and he could not get any of his two-bit magicians to tell him what they meant. And God empowered this young man, Daniel, to come and explain. It's a familiar passage. I think most of you are aware of that. As a result, he was appointed the chief of the academy of these magicians. Now, think about that. That's pretty astonishing. A Jewish kid is in charge of the Academy of Iraqi Magicians, if I can put it that way. All right? Yeah. Okay. How about that? By the way, here's something. Uh, my heart breaks for what happened in Pakistan. Here's something to think about. That animal who blew himself up and killed a bunch of Christians over there, immediately was taken in captivity and is now sitting in a place called torments awaiting final judgment and he now knows that his final judge is a Jewish man named Jesus from Galilee. <laughs> How about that? What a bad day for him. So Daniel put in this position of authority over these magicians. What do you suppose he did there in the Babylonian uh, court? Hey, why don't you guys teach me some of your magic? I don't think so. You know what he did? He said about evangelizing them. He said about telling them the truth about the God of Israel. He said about telling them about Jesus Christ. And you know something? Most of them refused to listen. Most of them said, oh, come on. I'm not going to sign up for your religion. After all, I have an advanced degree in Babylonian magic. But some of them were convicted of the truth. Some of them put their faith in the God of Israel. Some of them became believers, received everlasting life, and are alive today in heaven, and we'll get to meet them someday. How about that? <clears throat> Never underestimate the power of the gospel. Never underestimate the power of your faithful delivery of the word of truth to a dead and dying world. Never underestimate, even if the person you give the gospel to gives you the finger. Let me tell you something. God is powerful. His word is powerful. His word will not return to him empty for the purpose for which he gave it. So his intent is that man should live forever with justified righteousness because of Jesus Christ. You are a servant of the Most High God just like Daniel. Daniel gave the gospel. Did Daniel know exactly what was going to happen? I don't think so. Did Daniel know that one day... There would be shepherds out in a field who would see the star. Yeah, he knew that from Scripture. Did he know that the Magi were going to come to the land of Israel? He didn't know that. But Daniel was faithful. And God used his word powerfully so that some received everlasting life. Daniel gave the gospel to a bunch of Babylonian astrologers, and some believed. Slide, please. Though Daniel may not have known it, because he was faithful with the powerful word of God, things changed. Daniel spelled out in Babylon that Messiah the Prince would come to Israel. And he told them exactly how many years would pass from the captivity to the birth of the king of the Jews. 
We can link that to another prophecy that's found in the book of Numbers, slide please. In 2417, much earlier, another astrologer magician named Balaam was compelled by the power of the Most High God to reveal some truth about the Messiah of Israel, and he said that he would receive the sign of a bright kolkat, a star, a bright shining demonstration of the birth of Israel's king. So, slide. These wise men, these magi, these court astrologers, next slide. They studied the scripture. Daniel taught them how. They passed on the truth of the gospel to their children and their children's children. And 400 years went by. And Israel had returned to the land. Some Jews stayed back in Babylon. But Israel returned to the land as the prophets foretold so that Messiah could be born in Bethlehem. Daniel had, Daniel had evangelized those court magicians while in captivity, he taught them to search the scripture. They read about another astrologer named Balaam, and they believed. And that's why they brought this testimony with them. That's why they believed. By faith in God's word, they had come to understand that whenever they saw the bright star, that meant God had brought eternal life in the form of a little baby in order that the human race might be rescued. Slide. So acknowledging his kingship, they brought with them presents. They brought gold because they wanted to acknowledge that he was the king, the Lord of Lords. By the way, it turned out the gold was pretty helpful when Joseph and Mary had to flee down to Egypt for a couple of years. God can provide in ways that we don't expect. Amen. Slide. They brought luxurious frankincense, which according to the Torah, was a key ingredient in the incense that burned on the altar in the temple near the Holy of Holies, revealing that these astrologer magicians who had become believers and studied the scripture, they understood what a lot of the rabbis in Jerusalem did it. They understood that the tabernacle and the temple were all about Jesus. And they brought costly myrrh. Next slide, please. Which is the ingredient of the first century embalmer's craft. Testimony to the fact that they understood that the prophets foretold that Messiah would suffer and die. And so they came to worship the one who would die as a ransom for many. To the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. Next slide. This morning, may we remember something as we prepare to head out into a dark and dying world this Christmas season. Wise men walked a long way from Iraq, a place that doesn't have a good track record of worshiping Jewish leaders. And they came to see a Jewish baby, not because of astrology, not because it was popular, but because they were convicted by the faith that they had placed in the Word of God. Taught to them by a faithful young Jewish kid named Daniel, a young man who had trusted and looked forward to meeting his Messiah. So much so that he didn't allow the circumstances that were in his life to get in his way. So as we prepare to remember Messiah's birth this year, I want to invite each one of you to think a little bit about the enduring testimony you can have as a servant of the Most High God, as a faithful believer. Here's the thing. Unbelievers celebrate Christmas. Unbelievers celebrate Christmas. Believers celebrate Christmas because God is a good God, a faithful, loving, and patient God, and they know that they've been saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Faithful believers, disciples, followers, purposeful followers of Jesus Christ <laughs> celebrate Christmas, the Messiah, the King of Kings, born to die so that sin would no longer be the issue, and they do it in a way that leads them to want to tell others. Okay? Amen. So the question now is no longer about sin. The question is simply, do you trust him? As to my son, who do you say that he is? Did you place your confidence in his person and work? You too can have everlasting life because of Christmas. But do you trust him enough to tell others? Merry Christmas, Braddock. Excellent.